Manchester Football Social. There you go, there's a lesson for everyone in the news. If as a football manager, you're not good enough to beat Manchester United at home, you're going to get the sack. <laughs> this is the Manchester Football Social, the voice of fans in Manchester. Get involved today, have your say. 0345 treble one 76 25 is the phone number the text number is eight double seven double one something i want your opinion on later on today if pep Guardiola had joined united instead of jose Mourinho joining united and jose had gone the other way and joined city where would both clubs be right now what kind of state would they be in your views on that a little bit later eight double seven double one send us a text Tell us what you think now. A little sliding doors moment. A what if eight double seven double one on the text. We're going to get into the games very soon as well. And in the studio this evening, we got Steam McKinnery and for the Blues, sorry, and we got for the Blues and for the Reds, we got Statman Dave, aka Dave O'Brien. Evening, boys. Evening, Evening, mate. How's it going? All right. So, what did you make of the weekend's action? I'll let uh, Dave read this. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's always going to be United lie. first at the moment, isn't it? It just feels like that's <laughs> where everything me. to talk about is. I've got my feet up and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of we've got to address, haven't we? It's the elephant in the room. Yeah. Manchester United drew again against the team in the relegation zone. Quite frankly, there was some play that was good, but the majority of it was very, very poor. The two goals they conceded, but the overall like slowness and turgidness in central midfield and coming out of the back of a back three where you put ten- two central midfielders there, not enough penetration, absolutely rubbish. What was that starting lineup about? Well, I think it was an interesting starting lineup if it gone a certain way. I think if it was a four-four-two, a bit of aggression in central midfield. I'm thinking, look, United might go on to win this game comfortably, but playing the two central midfielders at the back with Phil Jones, it just wasn't the right thing to do against Southampton. What was the problem with the starting lineup, then, Steve? You say, look at it, it's a mess. I mean, Jose Mourinho. I mean, has he kept the same starting lineup at any point no, in the season? No, it felt like a point he was making with McTominay where he was. It's just, um, I don't know. It feels like gamesmanship once again, which is what he does. I don't, it just didn't look. The aggressive reaction you see with the United fans on Twitter, as soon as that team was announced, they were they were apoplectic with rage. Uh, <laughs> and like, I, I, it's always easy to say as well if it had, if it had worked, you know, then it, well, it was right. But then I guess that's hindsight for you. And, and the fact that they were 2-0 down after, you know, such an early part of the game, it's just, I don't know, it seemed to be inviting trouble. I've seen a lot of people say this year, and I saw it on social media after the Southampton game again, that people genuinely believe that Jose Mourinho is trying to sabotage this season <laughs> in some way, that he's trying to make a point every game in playing players that he doesn't believe are good enough and leaving others on the bench. He's, I mean, that's a ridiculous He's philosophy, done isn't it, it before, he... though. He's done it before at Chelsea, quite famously, years back. And he, um, who did he play? I think he played Essien in defence in a cup game just so because he didn't get 1.4 million to sell tell Ben Heim years ago. So he has got this side to him. But he must, but that, really, again, that's, that's all in like, hindsight. Right? That is the beauty of hindsight. You can be like, Jose Mourinho did this because of this. Whereas, well, quite frankly, he, he could have said, <laughs> Mourinho has no fit centre halves. So he had to play a midfielder in defence. Instead of playing one midfielder in defence, he decided to go with two, which potentially was the problem. And I think that's the side of it, is that it's great looking at these situations. OK, you know, Mourinho wanted to buy a centre-half, he pushed for it in the in the summer window. But now, right now, doing that sort of post-mortem analysis of that game and saying, bang, Mourinho's making a point. I think that's looking away from where we should be looking in terms of the style of Manchester United. I think that's potentially something that needs to be defined at, at the top level. You know, what? how United play? Do they play with wingers? Do they play fast football? And then signing managers that fit that bill. And I think that's the solid foundation to a good football club. Southampton's a really interesting one, actually, because they had these great appointments, like Sir Pochettino being their manager, and now they've picked Mark Hughes and they've sacked him not long afterwards, even though he didn't beat Manchester United and all that stuff that's flying around Twitter, which is absolute nonsense. But at the same <laughs> time, it, that's, they were progressive and they were picking the right manager, a pressing manager that's you know got some sort of new ideas and maybe that's what United need to go down. Let's, you know, Obviously, we've had a certain number of managers since Ferguson left and that is the problem. But having that identity... RB Leipzig is an interesting one. Hassel Hootel uh, was RB Leipzig manager. They played pressing football, four, mm. sort of 2-4, pressing from the front. But that's a style that they've got as a club. Obviously, Red Bull put a lot of money into there, but they have a style. And I think that's what needs to be sort of, maybe, you know, you've got to sit down, you've got to think about this long and hard. Gary Neville always talks about wingers attacking football, but you've got to define how you attack. And I think it's a little bit harder than people just saying, play attack, you know, play attacking football. Yeah, yeah. Because you can have possession for, for days, like City do times, that's boring, that's, that's so boring to watch. I don't yes, think yes, oh, oh, let me finish this point. Yes, they play some wonderful football intricate, but, you, you know, for 60 minutes of a 90-minute game, you could see City playing around the back four. 
that's not for me. I know exactly that could be about for some about. City fans, I, but that's I not for me. I completely agree with you on that. Watching City sometimes is boring, and yeah, they play beautiful. <laughs> so that is attacking football. football. That is that is attacking football. Louis Van Gaal for for all of his you know you the, the stuff he did. Miles. He played attacking football. Cannot. He had possession. His attacking this football wasn't for everyone. Is difference. Like Van Gaal had. It's like having you know like. It's just too, only a few parts of the cake there. Like, obviously, Pep, like, you can't watch City knock it about from the back around defenders, around, around people pressing that beautifully, and then knock 40 yard passes against Manchester United in the derby and not say that's boring football. That was absolutely. But at the gorgeous. same time, they've stung teams. The game against Liverpool was a boring game of football because of my Pep Guardiola. Yeah, that was City. a once in a blue moon, you know? No, but at the same time, that happened, that happened this season against Chelsea, I think it was as well. Uh, in the in the uh, community shield, completely killed the game. The Played it around the back. You see, this is what I'm saying. Defining attacking football is the interesting side You've of football. Two very rare anomalies in a team that scored more goals than any other team. But I'd also more... s- I'd also say that complete dominance is boring. Yeah, so I agree. Yeah, that's point a different thing entirely. But you counter attacking football. That you were, that's uh, what you kind of want. You want fast counter attacking, <laughs> direct football, switching the ball to flank to flank, getting it to wingers, getting involved. And there wasn't enough from United. The three five two doesn't give you two wingers. When you started talking there, Dave, before we got into the whole issue that Louis van Gaal is better than Pep Guardiola, <laughs> whatever point you were <laughs> making at the beginning, and I paraphrase a little bit, you seem to be suggesting, I don't want to get into the who replaces Jose Mourinho debate, but you seem to be suggesting that Jose Mourinho is not the right man for Manchester United with the style of play that the fans expect. I think, you know, with Mourinho, I think is is we've looked at his reign and... Yes, he could be doing better at the same time. Maybe the lack of investment compared to his rivals this summer was a big thing. But I think the, the interesting side is the players like Fred, like Pereira, who should maybe be in the squad and could help. When you're like Mourinho, that defensively are, f- are fantastic. You know, we saw the game against uh, Juve, how United came from nothing, changes the game with the substitution. Like, he still has it. But maybe those moments aren't as frequent as they were in his early part of his managerial career, where he's making bold decisions where he take three players off at half time, then go in. So... By introducing players like Fred, like Pereira, at the start of the season, you're thinking this is going sort of the right way. But by having, you know, playing the likes of Fellaini and Matic still is is the issue in a way. But again, you've got to think of it as a, as a collective group. He needs leaders in there. He needs people who are going to fight. The big one that I'm really surprised about is Ander Herrera because whenever he's played for United over the last few seasons, when he gets a run in the team, probably one of the best midfielders in the Premier League. Like he, he can get that to that level, but it's that Wayne Rooney needs to play every single week to get to that top level. I'm not sure I'd go with you in one of the best midfielders in the Premier League. On form, the one th- on form, the I'd one say. The thing I think he does bring is a little bit of fight, a little bit of determination, and he's always struck me as a man who would bleed for that United shirt. And that's what Jose Mourinho was talking about after the game. The fact that he wanted, in his world, he wanted mad dogs. He has him right the there, and he doesn't use him. What does that tell you? Well, that's it. Why do United seem to lack this spirit at the moment? And that was evident against Southampton. <laughs> I, I, I personally just think he blames everyone but himself. I mean, but I've got a theory that in general, Mourinho's kind of brilliance was built around this kind of special facade. And like, in general, it was true. He was this young, effervescent, highly vibrant manager and gave the, you know, everyone loved him. And I think as soon as there was just signs of weakness, that kind of front's cracked and just players... Yeah, but at the same time, he's like won him. the Champions League twice. You, yeah, but that was a long time ago, is the point. Like, yeah, but he still won the Champions League twice. I yeah, don't think it's just built change. on the facade. That, 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 Alex Ferguson is not the norm. Managers don't stay at the top that long. They don't look at Wenger. Wenger struggled to adapt to the change in the Premier League, and he did, and Wenger was kind of good hung on, but he didn't adapt to it. And in my opinion, Mourinho hasn't adapted to these younger kind of pretenders, to his crown. And, and that like, has yeah. been a change. When you look this at the... Football's changed. It has changed, game, yeah. Bournemouth play I mean, now, it's, and there was. I mean, five years ago, you wouldn't have had a team like Bournemouth playing the kind of football that Bournemouth are now playing. But then you, this, this is the big thing. Like the Bour- Bournemouth have been playing this style since they got promoted. Why are we just identifying that Bournemouth are a good footballing side? We're, this we're, is we're this is the, the this is sort of the hypocrisy of the whole thing. That if Mourinho does something or Mourinho says something, we all jump on him. He analysed the game perfectly in his post match pre- press conference. We need more mad dogs. We Sam. need more players like Marcus Rashford who had a great game. Let's not take away Marcus Rashford is one of the most talented young players in world football and he has the work rate that is something that you don't get from a lot of top players you look at his sprint numbers 25 sprints against um, Southampton at the weekend more than any United players managed in a single game you take the two assists he's got fantastic individual assists running in behind creating that goal for Lukaku dropping deep turning three players bursting in cutback Herrera you're thinking this guy has got talent this is the t- this is the mad dog the Man United need to build their team around but doesn't United have those mad dogs they've just been neutered at yes. the moment, when you look, Fellaini, uh, Matic, you'd say, could be a mad dog. Herrera, 
Phil Jones on his day, he's a mad dog, isn't he? They're all players that play with passion, that play for their badge. They just don't do it at the moment. But well, again, you've got to look at the player performance, haven't you, as well as, as well as how they're set up and how it all works. I, I completely disagree with the, the five at the back system against Southampton. The thing is, with Mourinho. It's too defensive. You need to go and attack them, and that's the big thing. They're so open to be broken on. You're playing maybe three forwards or four forwards in that game, and that's something that was available. That obviously, there was a reason why you play a back five, you match their system. Yeah, maybe that's not the right way. But in terms of the pressing, it wasn't there. It was, it was too passive. You look at the best defensive sides in Europe, Diego Simeone's Atletico Madrid. They are so aggressive in their defensive third. And that's what, again, Mourinho was starting to talk about, that, that aggression. Watch United 99, same thing, aggression in their defensive third. Something that United have lacked is that. And whether For United to progress in the next few games, look, Herrera needs to start, Fred needs to start. Simple as that in midfield. You've got to have, you've got to have that aggression. And that, those two will bring it. Give Dave the job. <laughs> know what's going on. Right, Brian's on the phone. Evening, Brian. You okay, mate? Evening, Jim. You all right? Yeah, very well. What are you saying about the weekend's game? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need I to say. What, I've got to turn my hat off to the United fan who's just called City boring. So as the conference <laughs> after the weekend, I was saying, I'm like, oh, man. That's been my weekend. Um, You're welcome, bro. I don't know. <laughs> The setup was just, it was so negative, and I'm thinking, I, I was genuinely thinking, we're going to go to Southampton here, he's going to put an attacking side out, and we're going to turn them over and get a good goal haul against them, and everyone will be like, oh, he's, he's changed around here, buy him another couple of weeks. I was thinking, no, I don't want that, I don't want another couple of weeks just off of beating Southampton. Like, we should be putting four past them, five past them. But the setup was so negative. And it, it genuinely looks to me like like Mourinho's got that squad, and that squad might as well be a Rubik's Cube to Mourinho, because <laughs> he has not got a clue what he's doing with it. So he's just sort of sat there looking at it, thinking, what do we do with this team? And I'm thinking, just pick the team, man. You've four players, play them. Do you think that he has the players there? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about from Mourinho himself about saying he hasn't got the pieces he needs. But do you think, fundamentally, he's got the right players in that team? He's just not able to put that jigsaw together somehow? There's players there that are, that are more than capable of winning games. It's just they've got no confidence. And they, they, that is a man management skill. Like, he genuinely cannot manage people. I, imagine him managing the team that had Roy Keane in it. Oh, my God. Keane had never got a game. Imagine Cantona now he's managing that team. Cantona had never got a game. It, it, it's crazy. He just can't manage players. I don't know what it is. Well, it's his ego. That's what it is. But the players that he's got... Then, they're not the players in the league that they are. That's not the reflection of their talent. It's a reflection of his ego. Let me ask you about the Paul Pogba scenario, Brian, because you talk about man management. This is the rumour that was going around on social media post-match. I've no idea whether this is true or not, but the rumours were that there was an argument between Jose Mourinho and Paul Pogba in the dressing room afterwards. Paul Pogba was described as a virus by Jose Mourinho. <laughs> He said to him, and this is the quote that's been uh, attributed to Jose Mourinho, you are like a person with a flu in a virus in a closed room. You pass that virus on to others. You don't play, you don't respect players and supporters. You kill the mentality of good, honest people around you. If that, I mean, that, that, if that is true, then... Yeah, if that's true, he's not nice, but listen, if Pogba's a virus, if, if Pogba's a virus... Your O's is Ebola. That's what's going on. He is. Brian. <laughs> Brian, you're not going to top that, mate, so I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Cheers for coming on. I appreciate that. Cheers, Jim. We've got Russell on the line as well. Evening, Russell. Ebola, that's genius. <laughs> yeah, you've got to follow that. What did you make of the Southampton game? How long have you got? <laughs> Right, to be honest, it's not the Southampton game. It's the last three years. Right, if we recap a little bit, Moyes, I think everyone knows that was a bad choice. Yeah? yeah. He was on a hiding to nothing. He was the wrong choice. He was dour, but we move on. Okay. Van Haar was bad. But he was funny, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he loved the red wine, didn't he? Whereas Jose, you know, like in a cloud, in a cartoon, rather, you've got someone who's been followed around by a black cloud raining on the head. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's Jose. 
since he arrived, it's been like, you know when Fergie arrived at that party that Giggs and Sharpie were at in Blackpool? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a night out I want to hear Parties about. over, lads. That, that's the last three seasons. When Mourinho first came into the club, I thought there was a positive feeling about him. I remember him going in and saying he was the happy one and he kind of looked settled, he looked positive. He didn't look like the man who got sacked at Chelsea. That disappeared pretty quickly, didn't it? It seems like that Jose Mourinho that everyone thought they were getting disintegrated pretty quickly and you did get this dour Portuguese gentleman as your manager instead. Yeah, and I, but I think that the first season they managed to cobble the way to somehow getting, you know, winning the Europa League and getting in the Champions League and winning, was it the League Cup they won? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, but if you look at the actual, I mean, I, I said to the lad I sit next to at Old Trafford, if you look at the number of games now that you actually go to and you're buzzing when you come out, we can't be talking more than two or three a season. Did you guys watch the Arsenal Spurs game yesterday? Oh, it was a fantastic mm -hmm. game of football. It was great to get away. Great escapism from. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I watched that and I just I was jealous. I just thought, regardless of the result, there were two teams just going at each other on the pitch, off the pitch. Everything was right. Yeah, hundred percent. I think Eric Dyer obviously takes a lot of stick for what he did, but at mm. the same time, it was a derby. Yeah. You want that passion? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But even the Liverpool Everton game, it wasn't great. But if you look at some of the challenges that the Everton, the Everton players throw themselves in front of the ball trying to stop Liverpool scoring, we're a million miles away from that. Even the Manchester derby recently, I mean, I'm coming from a City fans perspective, but there was a, such a distinct lack of fight from, yeah, from United's yeah. side. We, were sat, we, just, we were comfortable, we strolled that. We didn't even play our best and turned out three yeah. winners. You felt it should have been more, uh, just a little bit of something. So for you, Russ, is it top down? Sorry, go Is it is it top down? Is that basically what you're saying? The issue here is know. with Jose Mourinho, and that's reflecting the squad. It's not a lack of players. It's not the board that aren't giving him the backing. It is buck stopping Jose Mourinho. The argument is, well, who would you have in his place? And like it, everyone knows, the Glazers aren't going to go anywhere. Um, so there's always going to be a certain amount of money siphoned off. But if you look at the Premier League table now. United are, what, level with Everton on points, just below them on goal difference, which is a joke, but anyway. <laughs> but look at the teams below United. Leicester have got one point less than United. Bournemouth have got two points less than United. Watford have got two points less than United. Brighton aren't that far behind. Now, you can say, Jose could quite rightly say, well, how are we supposed to compete with that lot over the road that have been artificially inseminated okay <laughs> <laughs> got to like a racehorse <laughs> yeah no but and, and that's a fair point but you can't tell me you can't compete with arsenal mm. spurs yeah. everton watford bournemouth you are competing with watford so, oh. <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean though yeah yeah I don't know. russ that's an absolutely great point thank you very much for coming on appreciate that Take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free the story from Russ. Can we it's going to be okay, Russ. Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure Russ is okay. 0345 treble one seventy six twenty five is the number if you want to get involved tonight. Eight double seven double one is the text number. There is so much still to go through just from the United game this evening. So you can come on and talk about whatever you like. I particularly want to know what you think would be the scenario right now if Jose Mourinho had gone into the City job and Pep Guardiola had gone into the United job. Will it? literally be a case of roles reversed. 87711 on the text. You can give us a call. 0345 111 76 25. That is the phone number. Manchester Football Social. Three ways to get in touch with the Manchester Football Social this evening. 0345 111 76 25 is the phone number. 87711 is the text number. You can find us on Twitter as well at MCR Footy Social. I'm Jim. Steve McInerney is here for the Blues. We've got J Dave O'Brien here for the Reds. Yeah, some news uh, over this break. We just found out Manchester United may be without eight defenders versus Arsenal. Of course, <laughs> reported by The Telegraph. That is Chris Smalling, Eric Bay, Phil Jones, Luke Shaw, Victor Lindelof, Antonio Valencia, Matteo Darmian, and a suspended Ashley Young. Are you playing wow. right back tomorrow then? <laughs> I, I think that might get the call up. I'll probably have to get the, the registration papers quickly through the Premier League. But I've been looking at permutations of a back four, maybe. Go you on. could potentially go I mean, with Scott. Firstly, having eight defenders missing really spoils Joe 
Jose Mourinho's tactics of playing eight defenders in his starting <laughs> 11. Hey, so it's keep keep, keep those thoughts to yourself, lad. <laughs> but I know either you look at um, some of the young players to come in, Ethan Ethan Laird's been very, very good for the under 18, so it'd be nice to see him in um, playing maybe with Nemanja Matic, Marcus Rojo, and Diogo below as a very inexperienced back four. Yeah. So looking at Arsenal as well with the form of a Bemiang top scorer in the Premier League now with 10 goals. I am a little bit worried as a Manchester United fan. <laughs> well, that's it. So it's Arsenal on Wednesday, missing eight defenders. I've constantly been thinking for the last few weeks, every time a bad result comes around, I'm expecting a couple of days later there to be an announcement from Manchester United that they've had enough and Jose's gone. If United get hammered by Arsenal, and we've seen at the weekend Arsenal can score a few goals, is that it? Could that be it? Or will he get special dispensation by stay. having eight defenders out? Stay. I think it's difficult, isn't it? We've we've seen Fergie deal with her before. There were some great teams that he put together with the likes of Michael Carrick and Darren Gibson at centre half. Yeah. Wasn't your team terrible for the eight two as well? Wasn't it? Like, yeah, it wasn't the greatest team actually. Yeah, Ash Young scored a banger though. Unfortunately, he's suspended, so that's a big problem there. You have Wayne Rooney, Danny Welbeck. Team so of fighting. Wh- whatever happens, whether it's Jose Mourinho at the helm over January, whether it's someone else, there needs to be an investment in the squad defensively, doesn't there? Yeah, I'd, 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 again, I'd love to see Tuan Zabi back at the squad, back at the, t- the team in the squad. I think he's a wonderful player. I think he's showing now at championship level that physically he's up to the battle. He was good last season against us as well. Uh, yeah, this is the thing, he's, he played well in pre-season. It was one of those players that I remember watching in the, the under-23s and looking at him being like, this guy can play. I think that's a big thing with centre halves coming through. That you see a lot of good physical centre halves that are good at defending, but playing, bringing the ball out of defence. You know, he looks a little bit like Rio Ferdinand when he was bringing the ball out, carrying it into midfield, and that was at the youth level. Of course, you got to translate that to first team football. But he has the confidence he's shown at Aston Villa that he's absolutely, you know, a proposition for Manchester United. And at Manchester City, I mean, this has been shown with John Stones. You need a manager that is going to show faith in that player and allow him to make those mistakes. Because yeah. if you're a player, as Rio Ferdinand did when he was going for the ranks at West Ham, if you're bringing the ball out of defence, you make mistakes and you cost goals. Yeah, 100%. I think the thing with Rio Ferdinand and John Stones is the consistency of Rio Ferdinand. I think John Stones has been great this year, but I think when there's a test for him, I'd like, I'm looking forward to the next big test for him. When he's going to be pressed, there's going to be pressure on the ball, there's going to be movement in behind him, him, that'll be the next test for John Stones because Rio Ferdinand is miles ahead of where John Stones is right now. Yeah, I probably agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, you got you consider that he's young still. You know, mm. relatively, he's only twenty four. You know, he's got another ten years at the top potential, and you could easily look back and say, I'm not saying it'll happen, but he could potentially have the same legacy as Ferdinand. Potentially, if he has ten years of winning trophies at the very top. But yeah, I, I think all the City fans would admit there was a lot of mistakes in his game, but he definitely has come on leaps and bounds, and he's getting consistency now. Finally, so it's all good. Right, let's talk about Jose and Pep and the potential if they swapped Old Trafford and the Etihad respectively. When Jose Mourinho was appointed at United, there was a chance that could have been Pep Guardiola. But what situation would we be in now if that had happened? If Jose Mourinho was at City and Pep was at Manchester United, would it just be a complete switch? Would City be struggling mid-table? Would Manchester United be dominating everything in front of them? How do we think that would look currently? You can go first on this one, Steve. <laughs> How would it look if you had Jose Mourinho at the Etihad Stadium? I'd be in a straitjacket now. Um, <laughs> I, I just couldn't handle it. I didn't like Mourinho before that. I never really enjoyed his special one thing. That's not me saying that. He probably fights for tweets on me saying that years ago. But no, I, I don't know. I think... Well, I think City is slightly lucky. A lot of City, fan, City fans give um, Chicky Bergenstein and Sariano a bit of stick, you know, behind the scenes. But we have got we've got directors of football that actually understands football. I suppose United have a glorified accountant, you know, running theirs in terms of Edward, but good commercial manager, but not a good football director. As it is, I think maybe the ship might have been sailed a little bit better from Radio here than it would have United because I think for one we probably would have give him some of the players that he wanted um, and maybe we would have had a, a kind of stronger philosophy for want of a better phrase to right. push him towards I don't think it ever happened because they famously don't like him anyway as as because they're very much pro Guardiola but I think it would have eventually happened the same way because I think Maria's problems are in his head I personally don't believe they're um, necessarily uh, a Manchester United problem I think the same thing happened at Chelsea and I think this cracks started to show in his personality at Real Madrid a little bit um, so I feel like eventually United would have overtaken us um, they would have been playing glorious attacking football Martial would be a winning young player of the year or Rashford would do and uh, they, they'd, they'd be scoring 25 goals a season the way Sterling is and I dread to think it I think it'd be that good for them and that bad for us I think that is the interesting question isn't it Dave that 
actually, when you look at United, you can imagine that United team with Pep Guardiola there, and you can imagine Rashford and Martial Just absolutely flying. Quickly interrupt though, I do think City had players more built towards Guardiola style anyway, like David Silva. Well, they, they were prepping for four yeah, years exactly. before he came, weren't they? Exactly. Yeah, it was a little players, bit dodgy with the old Kevin De Bruyne thing, being being the manager at Bayern Munich and then being like, nah, we don't want to sign Kevin De Bruyne this summer. And he ends up in Manchester City a year after, but you look at the squads that Guardiola inherited, you, you, <laughs> Mourinho's winning the league with that, 100%. The money that he spent, Mourinho builds his own team with that. Mourinho builds a, a powerful team that has Kevin De Bruyne now as a 10, a different Kevin De Bruyne that he let go. The he Kevin De Bruyne go. that Mourinho let go wasn't the Kevin De Bruyne we see now. People forget that he was at Wolfsburg for two years mm. running the Bundesliga. And a number 10 in Mourinho's teams is one of the key positions. There you think Wesley Schneider, no you think Deco. It's 100% winning the league. If he has that money, he's winning the league. No, I'm saying there's no way De Bruyne and Mourinho are getting on again after all their history. There's no way. But, but at the same time, if, like if you're at Manchester City and your manager's Mourinho and you're getting paid all that money, you're dealing with that problem. Mourinho's going to be dealing with that problem because <laughs> now his main asset is Kevin De Bruyne. How, he, how would he win the league, though? He's dropping David Silva league. knowing Mourinho. That's well, what I mean. Like, he's, yeah, he'd well, probably sell him. I put him on the loan list. Sergio Aguero. Sergio Aguero is not, in my opinion, a Jose Mourinho centre forward. He's not that big physical player that Jose Mourinho likes, is he? But, but he's clinical. If you look I at all the forwards well. that do well under Mourinho, they're clinical. Diego Melito, absolutely clinical. Cristiano Ronaldo not played in a, in a central area, was his forward, was clinical. You move back and you know you look at all the good teams that Chelsea had. You had the likes of Drogba or even Lampard that was a clinical player. Mourinho wants that clinical player. He also wants a player that's good on the counter-attack. You watch De Bruyne at Wolfsburg, was the best counter-attacker in world football. Yeah, what does Mourinho like? He likes a player like that. The other thing, smaller margins, set pieces. De Bruyne, one of the best on set pieces. If you're telling me that he's not winning the league with that squad, I'm you're a madman. With Fernandinho at defensive midfield, as well as yeah, aggressive as Fernandinho. Like, it's perfect. But there's no way he's playing David Silva. Yeah, he's too probably, right. He's probably been in David Silva. Exactly. Good he's on an him. Idiot. Send him. <laughs> send him packing. <laughs> right, let's send him to Barcelona.